Hi, I'm Hugh Hewitt, coming to you from the basement of the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California. I am the president of the Nixon Foundation, and I'm joined today by Jeff Shepard for part three of Known Unknowns, Watergate, a podcast, series, book, video, and audio that plums what happened and what did not happen, what the public knows and does not know about Watergate 50 years ago with Jeff Shepard, a member of the president's White House staff from 1970 until the very end of President Nixon's presidency, perhaps the leading export expert on Watergate in the United States. I call him the walking, talking encyclopedia of Watergate. He demurs, he's uh, overly humble, but it's true. If you got a question about Watergate, you gotta find Jeff Shepard. Jeff, when we left off with part two, uh, John Ehrlichman had found out about the Ellsberg break-in. What did John Ehrlichman do when yes. he found out? What, what John learned uh, was that it had been an actual physical break-in and it was unsuccessful. And the team, Hunt and, and Liddy, wanted to go break into Fielding's home to see if by some chance the files were there. Uh, and he said, out of here, I don't want this anymore. This is, this is wrong. I didn't, I didn't approve this. So Gordon has nothing to do. Uh, the plumber's operation is in disarray. And uh, uh, John Dean gets introduced to the story because John Dean has been assigned responsibility by Bob Haldeman to develop a campaign intelligence plan. Re-election committee starting up. Uh, today, we would call that opposition research. Let's stop for a moment. The re-election campaign is heating up. The president is obviously going to run for re-election in 1972. This is September of 1971. Uh, the permanent campaign was not yet a feature. When you say that the election was starting up, I believe the committee to re-elect the president, perhaps the most misfortunately named organization ever because the acronym CREEP comes into the language. CREEP takes offices at the corner of 17th and K, subsequently occupied by Baker and Botts, where I did my first clerkship as a lawyer. Uh, I'm not sure that's where they began, but that's where they ended. What happened? Who set up the campaign? Well, uh, I thought it was uh, 17th of Pennsylvania. It, it was 17th of okay. Pennsylvania. Uh, 17th right across the street right. from the White House. It, it's kitty cornered from the yeah. old executive Baker office. Baker and Bott's office. It is, is, yeah, but at the time, it's Mudge Rose, Washington office. I mean, Mudge Rose is the fastest growing law firm in the country because that's the president's former firm. That's the attorney general's former firm. So they open a Washington office. They'll service their clients. And John Mitchell says, well, we'll just start because we'll start the committee to reelect the president over there. The big issue was, do we run the campaign, the reelection campaign, out of the White House or run it separately and watch it very carefully? And the decision was, we'll run it separately. So they Who made that decision and when? Must have been Haldeman and Nick Nixon and Mitchell and probably Ehrlichman. Is it on before. a tape, to your knowledge? Uh, I, there are many tapes, and I don't know if it's on a tape or not. All right. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't, to my knowledge obtained by the Watergate Special Prosecution Force. Uh, and as I told you in an earlier segment, the er early arrivals are seat warmers, placeholders. So there's this wonderful story that Chuck Colson takes over the communications division. Here's Jeb Magruder, a young hotshot who's hired to try to help Richard Nixon get better press. Uh, the most brilliant person in the world might not be able to accomplish that. Jeb wasn't. Jeb was a smile, a personality, a, a, a back slapper without substance. So he becomes the chairman of the committee to reelect the president pending the arrival of John Mitchell. Chuck Colson says, you know, Jeb now works for you. Chuck says, I don't want him on my staff. Let's, let's send him over to the reelection committee. He can't do any harm over there. Okay, so Chuck so, Colson doesn't leave the White House. Though. Chuck he, doesn't. Magruder he's overseeing does. the campaign no, from within no, no, the I'm White sorry. House. No, 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 no. He just he just sends Magruder over. Okay, that's all he does. Uh, uh, Magruder comes in as acting director, and they put some other people Tell over. Tell us there. a little more about Jeb Magruder. How old is he? What's his background? Do you know him well? Uh, no, I didn't work with him because he didn't do anything substantive. Uh, uh, he. Uh, uh, is uh, barely 30, uh, part of the young group at the White House. He was not involved in the campaign. Uh, interestingly enough, Gordon Liddy, uh, John Dean, and Jeb Magruder, the three people who helped bring down Richard Nixon, aren't intimately involved in the 1968 campaign. 
uh, Magruder is expendable, he's put over there, and there's some other staff. And, and the people who end up there early, and this may be unfair, there may be some exceptions, are people who aren't in critical jobs so they can be spared. And they start raising funds and they start writing memos and deciding what to do. <clears throat> and you can give money in secret up until the new law comes into effect on April 7th, 1972. So amazingly, they raised $10 million in advance of that deadline. In 1971 dollars? Maury Stans, former Secretary of Commerce, top guy. I knew Maury when we opened the library in 1989, 1990. Most yes. successful Republican fundraiser of all time before Fred Malik. Fred's dealing with different dollars, different time. Maury Stans goes around and sees people says, you know, the alternative is George McGovern. How much are you willing to give to protect your way of life? And people would say, well, I've never given this much before, that much before. He would say, I think it's worth 1% of your net worth. And, and they said if, if people didn't scratch through the tabletop, they hadn't asked for enough. They got a lot of money. So they have too much money <clears throat> with too little supervision. That's the real complaint. John Mitchell postpones coming over. Because Martha or because of justice? He's having so much fun at the Department of Justice. They, uh, Jeb Magruder needs a lawyer. He needs a lawyer because why not have a, a, an election committee lawyer? John Dean has been assigned by Bob Haldeman the responsibility of putting together a campaign intelligence plan, opposition research, perfectly legal. You need to know what the other campaign is doing where their next appearance is going to be, what their five-point program is, so you can counter it. And they've been competing with each other and trying to discover each other's secrets since time immemorial. Now, if I can pause, Jeff, it will become very convoluted very quickly. But up until this point, with the start of the campaign, the domestic side is different from the foreign affairs controversy. The decision to bomb Cambodia, the decisions that were to escalate the war or to take actions to bring the war to a conclusion, as was in 1973. These are controversial, but they have nothing to do with domestic policy. They eventually become wound up in the articles of impeachment you know, yes. under abuse of power. Yes. But are you aware of them as potential political impeachment issues at the time? Well, no, 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 not impeachment, but uh, uh, you're certainly aware of them because of the, uh, all the, uh, the children coming to Washington in protest. Uh, the moratorium. You mean the, the young adults, you don't mean children. Well, the, the moratorium and the mobilization and these efforts to, to uh, uh, object to the war and to shut down Washington, they raise law and order issues. We're heavily involved in making sure, yeah, you try moving 100,000 people, upset people into Washington and, and not having any buildings burned and not having anybody hurt and nobody gets shot. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're meeting with them, you're saying, look, We'll give you a permit. You can be down on the mall. And, and, and sometimes the reaction is, I don't want to be down on the mall. I want to confront. I want news coverage. I want, we're looking for action, you know, and, and you're trying to accommodate. So there's, uh, there's lots of interaction on the domestic side, not with the decision, but the aftermath of the decision. Quick Pat Moynihan story. I'm flying back from San Clemente on the plane. We're not on a government plane. We're flying commercial. Pat's in first class, but there's nobody interesting to talk to. <clears throat> so he comes back, <clears throat> and I'm in the front row because I'm tall, and he, he gets free booze. So he holds his glass up for more brandy into the first class, wait to the uh, stewardess refills it. Pat's sitting in the middle, a friend of mine are on each side, and we're talking about life, and Pat suddenly announces at the top of his voice, any man willing to bomb the women and children of Cambodia on Christmas Eve is a force to be reckoned with. And you're, and he's, he's teasing, but you look around, you know, you could get, you could get attacked on a plane for saying something like that because the secret bombing of Cambodia triggers massive reactions Kent in the State, press. In the, well, Kent is, State it Kent State, is Kent State reaction to that bombing or to the incursion into Cambodia? I can't remember. 
I can't either. But, but they're not Watergate related. My point well, is, these are controversies no, of the presidency. They have nothing to do with Absolutely Watergate. Though in the public miasma, nothing. that nothing. is the, the generalized idea of Nixon, they're all connected, but they're not. That's the war and the anti-war demonstrations. It's not Watergate at all. All right, so we go back to Watergate. Watergate begins with Ellsberg. <clears throat> Magruder goes over to open up Creep. Where John does... Dean is looking to hire a lawyer. John Aha. Dean's counsel to the president. Jeb Magruder wants a campaign lawyer. Dean needs someone to do a campaign intelligence plan. He looks around. He tries to figure out. He comes to see Bud. He wants somebody else. <clears throat> Bud says, how about my man Gordon Liddy? Now stop. Of all the saloons in the world, of all the bars in the world, you pick to come in, you come into mind. Rick's Cafe America. Right. How in the world can Bud Crow say pick Gordon Liddy? He needed to get rid of him. Gordon's on his staff. It's a lateral. Nothing to do. Uh, it, it's a... Uh, oh, my gosh. You know, in, in a bureaucracy, you get somebody you can't stand, you promote them to get rid of them. Yeah. Okay, you f fail upward. That's so what Gordon So Bud did. Crow mm -hmm. traded... Gordon Liddy to John Dean for a player to be named later, and John Dean sent him to Magruder? Yeah. John Dean recruits Gordon Liddy to develop the campaign intelligence plan, talking about a half million of money to do this. And he takes Gordon, Gordon Liddy, who's never met John Ehrlichman or anybody senior from Bud at the White House. John Dean takes Gordon Liddy over to meet John Mitchell, who's attorney general, he hasn't yet come to creep, and introduces... They go to the fifth floor at Justice? The they attorney the, general's office. There, there's a big room, there's a little room, there's an upstairs room where Bobby Kennedy had interesting meetings. Yeah. Were they in the big this conference room? This is the big room, room to the best of my knowledge. Right. Well, the uh, little teeny room in the back was for storage. Right. Uh, introduces Gordon Liddy as the guy who's going to do the campaign intelligence plan. Introduces Gordon Liddy as the guy... <clears throat> who's uh, uh, gonna gonna be counsel to the uh, reelection committee, and Gordon comes over in December of 1971, and I'm walking down the hallway of the old DOB, and there's this gorgeous hallway of blue, of, of black and white marble, and I'm walking down the hallway, and I said to myself, you know, this is really strange. I opposed Gordon Liddy as vigorously as a person could. He's come, he's left. And nothing has gone wrong. They must think I'm a fool. And then, you know, everything goes wrong. Gordon arrives at Creep, and he's talking about this campaign intelligence plan, and he's been offered a half million, maybe a million dollars to do it. And Magruder, I mean, just some of the stuff you laugh so hard it brings tears to your eyes, tra tragic tears. Magruder says that nobody has the authority, the budgetary authority, to commit numbers like that, except John Mitchell. We got to go see John, and you tell him what your plan is so he can approve the number. So on January 28, 1972, Magruder, Gordon Liddy, and John Dean meet with John Mitchell in the Attorney General's office. And Gordon has this set of charts made by the CIA that describe gemstone, gemstone. And it's ruby and diamond and, and uh, sapphire and all this other stuff. Beautiful description in uh, Gordon Liddy's book. Uh, uh, and it talks about mugging, bugging, kidnapping, and prostitution. They've created a monster. Gordon takes this stuff really, really seriously. And it's a criminal mind at work that comes up with this. Think about that. And, and, I mean, I can go through each one of those about why, what, what he was serious about. Uh, 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 and, and in this meeting, million dollars. And Mitchell's puffing on his pipe, and he says, that's not exactly what we had in mind. Ha! Excuse me. Uh, he doesn't say <laughs> Is that a quote? It is. No, no, no. It's testimony, sworn testimony about <laughs> it. That's not exactly what we had in mind. He never, he never heard a word about this. They didn't tell him that's why that's what Gordon had been. Well, no, that's not fair because Dean had in, had introduced him. So uh, they they ride back in the car, and Gordon says, "You guys didn't support me. You just left me out there all time." Time out. Did John Dean know what was coming when he took him over there? Well, you own the briefing if you know what's coming. 
Uh, John Dean is one of the most accomplished and successful purveyors of untruths that America has ever seen. Uh, he's very, very slippery, and so it's hard to pin him down uh, uh, because his, his testimony is very skillful. He has... He refuses to debate you, appear with you, or in any way, shape, or form never, reply to you. Never. Uh, uh, I believe he will leave the stage. He has threatened to leave conferences if they invite me. Uh, he, he has not shown up at the one where I was, and I'm not even a water guy, Watergate fellow, but I, I do believe that it is dishonorable for anyone to feature him in any documentary about Watergate or any dramatic production without at least having spent as much time with you as they have with him, because I do not believe him capable of telling the truth about Watergate. I think that's a very fair comment. I feel very strongly, but of course I lose every time on that argument. When I hear there's a conference, there's going to be a review, and I make my services available, we're sorry the program's full. We're sorry, we just didn't know. Uh, you can come attend because in the John audience. Because John Dean is a draw, and Jeff Shepard is John not. Dean is a clear draw, clear draw, and I'm, uh, I'm merely a truth teller. All right, so, as so, the, as, so but to uh, your knowledge, did he know what Gordon Liddy well, had cooked up? John Dean recruited Gordon Liddy for the job. John Dean was assigned. It's on the tape. He tells Nixon, this all started when Bob Haldeman assigned me the obligation of writing a, of preparing a perfectly legitimate campaign intelligence plan. When does plan. he tell that to Richard Nixon? March 21st when he goes in. 1973. When he goes in, it's called the cancer on the presidency speech. He goes in supposedly for the first time to tell Nixon what's really been going on. Okay, stop. That's a teaser. Well, you bet. That's, they can get to that when we get to that. They've got to go fair. through the work of listening. <clears throat> so, the they first leave meeting, the Department of Justice. First meeting, they, they say to uh, destroy the charts, Gordy. Did they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you bet. Burn them. Who told Burn, them that? Well, they must be in the car on the way home. Okay. Burn the charts. <laughs> go take a revision. <laughs> have a look. Like, <clears throat> that's like there's a, there's a movie with Brad Pitt. I think it's called Burn Bag, in which... Um, uh, a famous actor from Ohio State, J.K., says, oh, God, no, burn the body. <laughs> yeah, well, wow, let's get rid of it. It's the yeah, CIA guy. Oh, God, no, burn the body. You bet. So, Gordon revises his plan. Now the hit is a half a million. And Magruder calls up Mitchell. We're going to come back, you know, new plan. Mitchell won't meet with him. So, Magruder calls Dean and says, Dean, we got to, you know, it's got to do this. So, Dean arranges this meeting occurs on February 4th. Dean gets there. 1972. 1972. Yeah. Dean gets there a little late. Uh, and when he gets there, he says, you know, we shouldn't even be having this discussion in front of the Attorney General. Now, Dean would have you believe what he meant was, this is crazy, we got to stop. That's not what he meant. What he meant is John Mitchell deserves plausible deniability. You, Gordon, you tell me what you have in mind. You don't get to talk to Mitchell anymore. Because if something goes wrong, I want separation. Okay? Now, in that second meeting, a half a million dollar price tag. So the Attorney General did have a second meeting? Absolutely. We, it, 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 it differs on how long the meeting lasted. Might have been 15 minutes, might have been 30 minutes. But mugging, kidnapping, and prostitution are out. But bugging is very much in it, and they even talk about targets. <clears throat> Dean says he went back to the White House, went in to see Haldeman, said they got crazy stuff planned to creep. The White House has, should have nothing to do with it. Bob, when confronted later, said, I, I have no memory of such a meeting. Maybe he's telling the truth, maybe he's not. And that talk evolved, Dean's invention of that talk evolved into, I told Haldeman to turn it off, and so I washed my hands of it. I thought it had been stopped. That's when I dropped out, so don't blame me. Haldeman said in his last utterance, you know, upon reflection, there's no record of seeing Dean, uh, and Dean says, well, Higby worked me in, Haldeman's assistant worked me in. Higby has no memory of that occurring. It, it, and Holloman says, I think, I think upon reflection, this was a complete fabrication. I would have remembered if he came and told me this. I would have done something. Dean then says, I had no contact with 
Liddy from then on. We're still looking because I think there's going to be indications because uh, uh, when they, there were two break-ins. When they did the first break-in, there were fruits at of, the Watergate, at the not Watergate. the Ellsberg. We've gone no, way past different, that. Well, I, uh, I, I got ahead of myself. So the February 4th meeting ends with no approval, a limited plan. Uh, uh, Mitchell then goes over and joins the campaign on March 1st. He's now chairman of the campaign. Who and becomes the attorney general? Klein Dinkst, he's promoted as deputy. Deputy becomes, does he go right. acting or is he confirmed as attorney he's general? He's later confirmed, he becomes controversial because of the ITT scandal we're not going to get into. Yeah. Uh, Jeb Magruder needs Mitchell to make a bunch of decisions because he's arrived late. So he flies down on, to Miami, where Mitchell is, on March 30th, 1972, with a list of 19 important decisions that have to be made, the last of which is the Liddy Campaign Intelligence Plan. And this time it's priced at 250000 Of the other 18, do you yeah. recollect an example or two for the audience to understand? No, I'm sorry I can't, but I think it all had to do with campaign decisions might have been personnel, might have been allocation of money. Uh, it Television buys, what's Ailes going to do, yeah, this sort of thing. Yeah, it's Campaign not techniques. To, not relevant to me is Watergate. Number now, 19 there's, is... There's records. No, number 19 is relevant. <clears throat> it, it gets so intriguing, Hugh, because there's three people in the room. Uh, uh, Mitchell, his assistant that he brought over to the campaign from the Department of Justice, a gentleman by the name of Fred LaRue, uh, Fred LaRue will, is a Southerner, and he'll come up again because he's, he's at the re-election committee and he's intimately involved in the cover-up, but he's a Mitchell guy, and Jeb Magruder. Now, you've got to understand, Magruder's a White House guy. Everybody at the committee to re-elect came from one or the other. They're White House people or they're Department of Justice people. And they don't really trust or know each other. They don't have the working relationship. And I think one of the explanations for Watergate is each side thought it was the other guy's operation. And, and Jeff Shepard, when you say Watergate, what do you mean? Uh, I mean the break-in into the Democratic National Committee headquarters <clears throat> to plant bugging devices and to photograph files. Because there are many other scandals associated with the Nixon presidency. You just mentioned the ITT scandal. There's yes. the milk scandal. There's the Cambodia invasion and the secret bombing. Yes, there's the but, NSC wiretaps. But what we are talking about with Watergate is the campaign operation run out of 17th and Pennsylvania by G. Gordon Liddy. Yes. And the subsequent cover-up thereof. Yes. All right. Uh, in the great division of views of Watergate. Everybody agrees there was an illegal break-in. Everybody agrees there was an illegal cover-up trying to protect the people that knew about the break-in. The, the diversion is a disagreement over who knew and what the cover-up was designed to protect. The attackers of the president believe the president and his top staff knew or should have known about all this. The president's defenders beg to differ and say it all comes down to John Dean as the centerpiece. He recruited and hired Gordon Liddy. He was at these two key meetings where the plan was presented and when the people were arrested, caught red-handed in the DNC headquarters, John Dean was at risk of prosecution and knew it. So he led the cover-up not to protect President Nixon, but to cover his own tail. And when it came apart, when it all blew up, and it should have blown up, it was an illegal cover-up, John Dean switched sides in his story and said, I'll testify against my superiors if you let me go. And that's what happened. That is a great tell as well, a great preview of coming attraction. Back to chronology. Yes, sir. So the meeting happens. It's 250000 It's really reduced. It's Three down. guys in the room. Three guys in the room. And there's a different story coming out of the room. Uh, uh, Magruder says 
Mitchell said, oh, it's only two fifty. Let's give him the money and see what he can do with it. That Mitchell voiced approval. LaRue is in the room, and LaRue says, no. Mitchell said, this again, I don't want to see this anymore, and tossed it aside. Now, LaRue becomes a government witness. Mitchell says, I never approved it. He devotes half his time at the cover-up trial to saying, I never approved it. I had nothing to cover up. Magruder paid Liddy. Liddy's uh, in, in incurring debt because he's going on this plan and hadn't been approved. He didn't have any money. Magruder paid Gordon Liddy $37,000 before he went down to the Miami meeting because he thought, I think perhaps legitimately, that Gordon was going to beat him up if he didn't come across with any money. When did the Miami meeting occur again? March 30th, 1972. When does the break into the Watergate occur? Uh, June 17th. So between March 30th, 1972 and June 17th, 1972, people are hired, money is paid, and who other than G. Gordon Liddy knows what the hell's going on. Well, he brings his friend back, Howard Hunt, who's never become an employee but a consultant. He and Howard are the masterminds. They recruit the same Cubans. There's one Cuban different from the, the fielding break-in, and, and they're going to get him to break into the Democratic National Committee headquarters. And then the stories divert again. Uh, there's a break-in on May 28th that's successful. And supposedly, they plant a, a bugging device on the telephone of uh, Larry O'Brien, the DNC chairman, and a desk outside the office of a, a local official named Spencer Oliver. And his assistant is a lady by the name of Maxine Waters. Uh, and they bug her phone. And then uh, uh, the, the, the Larry O'Brien bug doesn't work. The Spencer Oliver phone is overheard by a, a gentleman uh, across the street at the Howard Johnsons. These bugging devices have to have direct line of transmittal to, to pick up the bug. Uh, uh, and he's hearing conversations. He's summarizing them. He's giving them to Creep. Giving them to Gordon Liddy. Yes, to Gordon Liddy. And what is Gordon Liddy doing with the summaries of the, in, quote, intelligence, close quote? As well, President Nixon would later say, you're not going to learn anything right. from Larry O'Brien in the DNC. Yeah, uh, but Larry O'Brien's bug doesn't work because he doesn't have line of sight to the hotel across the street. Only Spencer Oliver's works. There's some controversy over whether it really is Spencer Oliver's phone that's working. But uh, uh, the, the summaries go to Gordon. Gordon extracts stuff, gives it to Magruder. Magruder sends benefits of the campaign intelligence plan to an inter intermediary young lawyer named Gordon Strawn, who gives it either to Haldeman or Dean. Is Gordon Strawn a White House employee or a committee to reelect him? Gordon Strawn is a White House employee on Haldeman's staff, whom Haldeman has assigned to be his go-between to the campaign. Now, if I've Haldeman, got to ask Jeff. If, if Haldeman wants to know something, Haldeman calls the campaign. If the campaign wants to tell Haldeman something, they tell Gordon Strong. One of the, the great lawyers of our generation and a dear friend of mine is named Fred Fielding. Yes. He has subsequently uh, been counsel to President George W. Bush, a member of the 9-11 Commission, counsel to President Reagan responsible for Supreme Court justices, one of the genuine wise men. He was also John Dean's deputy. Yes, he but was. But emerged unscathed and untainted yes, by this experience. How does that even happen? Fred, of course, is the Sphinx. Fred will never tell anyone anything because he's a good lawyer. Well, uh, uh, John Dean is not a good lawyer. His only experience in private practice is six months with a boutique firm that did broadcasting applications. And he's fired after six months for unethical conduct, so he doesn't really know how to practice Are law. Are you sure of that? Positive. It's I got the uh, form. Okay. Uh, Welch and Morgan was the uh, the law firm. So he doesn't. He's not much of a lawyer, in your opinion. He's a public figure. We can't slander him, but just not well, much he, of a lawyer. Well, he, he he holds positions at the House Judiciary Committee and the Department of Justice, but he's not a practicing lawyer. Has no experience whatsoever except for six months, and he gets fired. Uh, 
when they start to get legal questions, he needs staff and he hires Fred and Fred is an excellent lawyer. And Fred becomes quite busy doing the, the real, real work, work of a real White House counsel. And John, John's a party guy. John's not a serious guy. He doesn't, he does, not involved in anything substantive. Uh, uh, so he's at Georgetown all night. Uh, he's he's uh, separated from his wife. He's partying. Is Gordon Strawn reporting to John Dean? No, Gordon Strawn reports to Bob Haldeman. So I believe the listener, even if they do not, and we're working without notes for their benefit. You and I are we're talking without notes because I wanted to make this as easy as possible for the listener. I think they have the organization chart in their mind down pretty well, which is Mitchell was across the street at the committee to reelect. Jeb Magruder is answering to him. Gordon Liddy is answering to Jeb. They are communicating with the White House via Gordon Strawn, who is working for Bob Haldeman, and via John Dean on a separate track via? Gordon Strawn testified to the Urban Committee that when he got a report from Creep that involved campaign intelligence, he didn't give it to Bob, he gave it to John Dean, because John Dean was still in charge. Gordon, Liddy, uh, Gordon Strawn is still alive. Gordon Strawn will not talk about this to his kids, to his best friends, even to me. Gordon says that the president once told him that there are no deaf mutes in prison. And he just keeps saying that. He will not talk about it. I don't know what that means. If you don't talk, if you heard nothing, if you say nothing, nobody can get anything on you. It's a little obscure, but he just keeps saying it, and he's just adamant. And I keep saying, you know, Gordon... It's been 40 years. You're working on a new book, Jeff, which I think this is a teaser for, and I think will be the definitive inside the legal history of Watergate that will come out in a few years. Do you think he and G. Gordon Liddy and others will talk to you now? It's almost 50 years. I hope so, because it's the last opportunity to get the truth out. Particularly, this book is going to focus on what the prosecutors did to Richard Nixon. My earlier books talk about why there wasn't a fair trial for, for Nixon's colleagues. <clears throat> but stuff has come out which is very unsettling with regard to the prosecutor's effort. They couldn't indict Nixon, but they wanted to sink his presidency, and they wrote memos about how they were trying to do it. So, and I'm looking forward to that. I'm hoping it's both personal and political, uh, an accurate summation of history and an interesting dive into the legal side of this. But I want your guess right now. Will who they talk knew? to me? No, no. I want your guess as to who knew what at this point. When the Watergate break-in occurs, does anybody know it's coming at the White it, House? It is uncontroverted that no one at the White House knew in advance of the break-in, <clears throat> with the possible exception of John Dean. When the break-in occurred... Not Chuck Colson. Well, when the break-in occurred, the people at the White House, Haldeman and Ehrlichman, were terrified it was a Colson operation. And they asked John Dean to look into it, and Dean said no, he wasn't involved. So, so take they, me to that morning. The, the White House... Uh, the Washington Post has on the front page, I believe it's the front page, break in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Yeah. Uh, they're caught really early Saturday morning, June 17th. I don't know that that story hits until Monday, but I could be wrong. Uh, but five or six guys are caught red-handed into the offices of the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate office building, and it's James McCord, who is the head of security for the committee to reelect the president, a retired CIA wire man who has <clears throat> bugging devices in his briefcase, and four Cubans, uh, one of whom has a notebook with Howard Hunt's phone number at the old EOB in the notebook. They have money on them and they have a key to a room across the street at the, uh, I think it was the Howard Johnson's at the time, hotel, and the FBI goes over and looks at the room and they find a total of $5,000 
of sequentially numbered, uncirculated $100 bills. <clears throat> That's what they have. The guys won't give their right names. They're arraigned, I believe, on Monday morning. I'm a little off on the dates. And the judge wants to know <clears throat> where McCord is employed in the Corb, says the CIA. And young Bob Woodward is down assigned to cover that, or maybe it was Carl Bernstein. And that's the beginning, excuse me, of the news that this could be connected to the committee to reelect. Committee puts out a press release. I think the press release was out on Sunday, so maybe this all occurred on uh, Saturday morning and Sunday. It's denying any involvement. Uh, before they knew what was going on. <clears throat> then Dean is recalled from Manila in the Philippines. Get your tail back here, there's real trouble. Who's called him? Don't know, but it comes through the White House. Might have been Fred Fielding. I just don't know, but he's recalled. He calls Gordon on Monday morning, and he says, Gordon, you know, because Gordon and, and Howard Hunt are nearby, but they're not caught, they're not arrested. Uh, Hunt panics, goes, figures out where's the safest place to dump my evidence, figures it's his office at the old EOB because it's guarded, and goes into his office and, and divests himself of evidence. Into a safe. Well, it couldn't all fit in the safe, but it, in the safe in his office. There is a safe in there Howard Hunt's office. There is a safe in Howard Hunt's office. No Howard question. Hunt being paid by the White House at this point. Well, they don't think so. They can't find a recent check, but they can't find a termination notice either. But you know, you can't just walk into the old EOB, even in 1982, even before 9-11. He's got a even pass. The passes don't expire. And one of the enterprising reporters calls that phone number, and the White House operator answers the phone. All right, so now my question is, you're working at the White House. You are a young, aspiring, ambitious lawyer working for John Ehrlichman on the Domestic Policy Council. You see this on the front page. Give me a human reaction to this. It's not my concern, not my worry. I'm working 14 hours a day on public policy issues. What kind of issues? Uh, law and order, crime and drugs, kidnap, uh, kidnapping, uh, uh, hijacking of airplanes, the bombing of, uh, the, by the Weather Underground and the Symbionese uh, 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 Liberation Army. Uh, the break, the, the, uh, uh, and you've I got to put this in the book. You've got to put what you're doing in the book. Sure, I can detail. I got no one, no one remembers <laughs> just how freaking crazy 1972 is. When I left the White House, I took my cron file with me. I have every memo I ever wrote because in the lots of places in the government, but certainly the White House, what you sign, you didn't draft. And what you draft, you usually draft for your boss to sign. And I wanted proof positive of what I had done because I wasn't involved. So you say, not my problem, I've got the Symbionese Liberation Army. Yeah. Just give a, a quick aside for the benefit of the young person. What's the SLA? Well, they're the ones that kidnap Pat, Patty Hearst. They're, uh, they're so opposed to the government and nominally to the Vietnam War, they're bombing people and things. Uh, the weather of the ground, the, the, the Symbionese Li Liberation Army. Uh, they're killing uh, people. They're killing people. There's no question. They, they blow up the ROTC building at Wisconsin, uh, and somebody dies. They kidnap Patty Hearst. Uh, they have uh, a shootout with the SLA. I don't know that any officers are dead, but there are two officers killed by the SLA at one point in this, this long is, saga. This is serious stuff. These and are so committed my, radicals. My point is that when this headline breaks, it ain't the only story in town. Oh no, not by a long shot. It's not a big story. It's not. It, it may have been headlines for the Washington Post. It, it, it's just no big thing. I don't know. I have to go back and look. I'll have to ask Bob yeah, Woodward, I who I once. I should mention at this point. I improvidently, as a young man, when I was the first director of this library, said in an offhanded remark that Bob Woodward would not be welcomed here. It was at the end of a three-hour tour of the archives, and the L.A. Times reporter said, can anyone come here? And I joke, well, I don't think Woodward and Bernstein. Front page, the, oh, old, yeah. the old man calls up yeah. and says, that's yeah, not do right. That. That's, no. Yeah, and so, I, you know, that. my bad, and I've apologized to Bob Woodward. Yeah. Everyone is welcome at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda. We hope they come. But I want to go back to the White House that week. Let me Any tell, sense of panic? Any sense of, of an event? 
No, because nobody, well, other than John Dean, nobody is involved. Liddy and Hunt aren't arrested until later. Liddy's fired from the re-election. Dean knows. They have a meeting Tuesday night. The, break, the guys are arrested Saturday morning. There's a meeting in Mitchell's office, uh, apartment Tuesday night, and it's John Dean and Jeb Magruder and Fred LaRue and maybe Bob Mardian and, and Mitchell, and they're trying to decide what to do because the guys... So run through that again so someone doesn't have to reverse the tape. The, uh, the break-in occurs... Saturday. Saturday. They're, arrested. They're, arrested. They're arrested. Saturday. News hits the White House. Dean is recalled from Manila, and he convenes a meeting. He, and who's in it? D d d d take a step back. They put out a press release on Sunday saying, uh, uh, we're not involved. Dean arrives back home on Monday, calls Liddy, says, you know, Gordon. <clears throat> Gordon says, my people. Dean says, we have to meet. He doesn't want Liddy to come over to the EOB. There'll be a record of the meeting. So he meets him outside on 17th, and they go for what I call the walk in the park. They go down 17th, you know, where the ellipse is, that area. And Gordon says, uh, they're my people, but they're good people. They won't, they, they'll hold steady. They won't say a word. But, I mean, you got to pay for their legal bees, b bills and stuff like that. Uh, and if you think, because I screwed up, and I did, I, there wasn't enough distance. Uh, I shouldn't have hired McCord. You know, he was working for Creep to do the, the bugging part. Uh, you just let me know, and I'll be standing on the street corner when you want a car to come by and hit me. So you want to take you want to take me out? I, I understand. I screwed up. Does G. Gordon Liddy agree, and John Dean agree that this meeting occurred and that offer was made? Yes, without question, it's uncontroverted. Uh, absolutely uncontroverted. How did these people end up in the White House? Jeff Shepard, Richard Nixon may be the most brilliant mind, and I know this will be controversial. Maybe the most brilliant mind ever to sit behind that desk. And he got frickin' frack walking around uh, uh, having executed an illegal break-in of... Uh, Stu, there's one individual who recently died who is principally responsible for hiring both onto the White House staff. Bud Crow. Bud Crow. Who I met for the first time at the Metropolitan Club, sadly not recovering from a stroke that would eventually kill him. But he did come to the last Nixon reunion. I'm told it's the only one he came to. Well, he after came to, the he, stroke. He, no, he, after the stroke, absolutely, because uh, it incapacitated half his bottom body. It was very hard. Bud would. Bud's always invited. Anybody, uh, anybody from the group can come. Uh, but it was it was painful for him to come because he would see these other people who went on to successful careers. David Young, a superbly successful career, uh, uh, and others. Fred Fielding. Fred Fielding. And great, great public service. Bud by hiring Gordon Liddy, by deciding to go operational, and by perjuring himself before the grand jury on the recommendation and urging of John Dean, ruined his life. This concludes part three of Known Unknowns, Watergate. When we pick up, we're going to start with that meeting, because I think we ought to begin, because the cover-up begins that day. You bet.